So I think that the issue du jour is balancing the humanity of what we do in our practice. Because mm -hmm. at the end of the day, recruiting is a people business. Yeah. And if you take a look around this floor here, there's a million AI platforms out here. And my kind of big talking point is any company, any person, any individual, I don't care who you are, utilize AI as a tool and not a crush. Mm -hmm. Don't overly rely on it. I mean, I, I think one big concern that's obviously a big topic is algorithmic bias big time. Um, in the selection process and particular selection and assessment process in particular. So that's always a concern, of course. And now we see, you know, some states that are actually banning tools like this, like New York, for example. Welcome to the podcast, where we introduce you to incredible humans who share their journeys with the mission to inspire you to harness your own inner tenacity to drive your life and career forward. And now, your host, Adam Posner. We are back here. I'm thrilled to welcome Jocelyn King. Jocelyn is the CEO of and founder of Virgil HR. Jocelyn, welcome to the podcast brought to us by our friends over at Fountain. Oh, thank you all very much for having me. So we're hitting the noon hour here at Sherm on the, I guess it's the second day technically here. Mm -hmm. And I feel like you're a veteran of these trade shows. Mm -hmm. What's a quick pro tip that a lot of newbies should be aware of when coming to these events? Ooh, pro tip. Um, get the shuttle bus schedule in advance. <laughs> be prepared for the shuttle bus schedule. Uh, line up for lunch the second you know it opens up. All Otherwise, the good sandwiches will be gone, exactly. right? Exactly. People go for the chicken, you're gonna get stuck with the veggie option. Exactly, yeah, Rookie you don't mistake. want that. It, every time, every time. And always come in for registration on Sunday. Don't wait until Monday, because it's a total nightmare. That's another pro tip. Even if you're coming off the plane, put your bags down, mm -hmm. come over. You don't have to be dressed up ready for the convention. You get your pass and, and head back. Yep. Well, I want to thank you so much for joining us here today. And we certainly want to unpack your journey. But I want to start off with congratulating you on an accomplishment. Recently earned a patent. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah, we we're very happy about it. Well, that's, that's a big deal. Yep. Why don't you tell everyone a little bit about the patent, tell the story behind it. Uh, oh gosh, the story. So the story kind of falls in line with my company, right? So, um, you know, I don't know if you want me to go into that right now or we, not. That's what we're here for. Okay. Um, so <laughs> I'll kind of give the And we're done. Thank you so much for joining us today. We're done. <laughs> Of course, we want to hear all about it. Yeah. Um, so uh, just really briefly then, kind of how I started the company, I've been an HR practitioner my entire career. I've been a recruiter before, but function mostly as a generalist for high growth tech companies. And um, I've managed recruitment teams, very large recruitment teams, small recruitment teams, managed pretty much every part of the HR process. My very first job as an HR director, um, maybe 10 years ago, uh, we hired someone in California. And I lost my crap trying to figure out what compliance requirements oh my, I had to meet structure, in California. All that, it's just a total, everything about it. The damn mess. state of California ruins everything. I, I mean, it's like the country of California. That's how they function. Yeah. The United States of California. Exactly. But we digress. Yes, exactly. So uh, I thought, you know, I'm spending so much time doing all this research on Google, trying to figure out what legal requirements I have to meet at a federal, state, and local level. Um, I am uh, going to lawyers, which is really expensive. There's just isn't a good solution out there. And there I, has to be a better way. Yeah, exactly. That's always how these start, right? <laughs> it is. Um, so I waited a long time to do it because starting your own company, there's a lot that you have to prep for financially, uh, personally, career-wise, et cetera. Yeah. Uh, so I started the company about two and a half years ago and very quickly built out the technology and submitted our patent application. You saw a need. You knew how to at least approach the solution. Mm -hmm. You went about it yep. in a systematic way. Mm -hmm. And let's talk about what the product is and the, and the patent the, the patent process for everyone out there doesn't realize how gaunt, what a gauntlet it is. It absolutely is. So the product itself is an employment and labor law platform. Uh, we have a web-based application and we also integrate with ATSs, HRISs, and payroll providers. Right. And we cover pretty much every aspect of the employee life cycle from a compliance perspective. So when we look at recruitment, since that's generally what you tend to focus on, um, you know, we're looking at uh, what you can and cannot ask in job interviews, the expansion of protected classes and how that impacts the questions that you ask, pay transparency requirements, uh, your job descriptions and how important those are from a compliance perspective, especially with like ADA requirements and stuff. There's that so kind of many elements you. to that. A ton. I mean, a, a ton. And then you get into onboarding and there's a whole nother mix there too. So what our software does is instead of going out and doing the research, we eliminate the need for you to do research. You can ask a question to our chat bot. Like I have an employee, 
I don't know. Colorado. Uh, uh, yeah, Colorado. I have an employee state. in Colorado requesting <laughs> parental leave. What do I do? Mm. And our chatbot will analyze what federal, state, and local employment and labor laws apply to John Doe and then gives very prescriptive step-by-step -step guidance to HR on what they need to do to be compliant. Um, we also have other aspects of our tool, an employee handbook builder, multi-state comparison tool, legal updates, ability to talk to a lawyer. Wow. Uh, but um, it's essentially a full Good. compliance suite, and we're here to help save HR and recruiters time, mitigate risk, and control legal costs so they're not going outside legal counsel. So a couple of questions, and just pure curiosity because I'm a recruiter in the industry. Mm -hmm. Is that platform that you built legally binding, legally compliant? Like, how do you ensure that what you're saying there is accurate? Or is there a disclaimer for anyone using it? There's a disclaimer, yes. Uh, don't, this isn't like, right. it's so best as possible. The most we're not a law firm, right? So we can't, we can't say like, oh, uh, you know, yes, we accept liability from this. We, we, we can't, we can't qualify for malpractice insurance because we're not a law firm. So instead there's a disclaimer. It does say, hey, we're not a law firm. We're not substituting as a lawyer. You're still responsible for these decisions. Uh, but I can tell you, not once has there ever been a mistake in the tool to date. Well, there, well, there you go. Not <laughs> but more importantly, Johnson, what did... What did you learn about yourself through this process of, of building this app from, from a personal perspective and as an HR practitioner? Uh, that's a good question. I think from a personal perspective, a lot of it has been around resilience. This is really hard. Starting your own company is a tough journey. Yeah. Um, the funding process is really difficult, building out the tech, selling, etc. So resilience, I've always thought of myself as a resilient person, but I didn't realize how far that would go. And resilience is such a core trait of, of any entrepreneur, but also senior leadership too. So let's talk a little bit about Virgil HR. Mm -hmm. We're just meeting for the first time. How do you explain your company to me? Uh, okay. Pitch um, me. Yeah, so <laughs> essentially today, employers have to comply with thousands of federal, state, and local employment and labor laws. You're going on Google, you're talking to lawyers, doing all this research, spending tons of time and money. Instead, you can use our tool to completely eliminate the research process uh, get information real time with real time legal guidance as well on what you need to do. Uh, and it essentially diagnoses the laws that are applicable to day to day tasks that you're working on. So I feel like you almost have a law degree without having a law degree. You're pretty close. You might as well just go for your law degree in addition to you all know the what? other. I've always wanted to. <laughs> I'm married to one. I love you, babe, but I think you should. You're fine. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it, it's a lot out there. So I want to talk a little bit about Sherm. We're here at Sherm. You are one of the few practitioners in the space who are also a CEO, and kudos mm -hmm. to you on that as well. Thank but you. Um, we're here at Sherm. How is getting Sherm certified you know, impacted your performance as a CEO? Oh, well, so I, I got Sherm certified well before I started the company. Um, and that was just something that I wanted to do for myself, right? But I think it's really helped from a credibility perspective. As you've said, there are very few HR tech founders who are HR practitioners. It's not common at all, mainly because as HR professionals, we're not very risk averse. Right. And it's a, it's a very fair point, too, because they're mostly builders, mm -hmm. they're mostly like techie founder builders. Mm -hmm. But you're a practitioner. Yeah. So you talk the talk, you speak the language, you're in the trenches. Yeah. So I do think that the credentials that I have have given me the credibility and the qualifications to sell the product, build those relationships with HR practitioners, build a product that people really want to use and feel like it's an easy tool to use and is, is really kind of achieving the goals that they're looking for. I love it. That's super, that's super exciting too. So let's, let's talk shop for a little bit. That's mm -hmm. why we're here. I'm a recruiter. You've done your fair share of the recruiting practice too. All I see on LinkedIn, Glassdoor, Fishbowl is a complete bashing of the recruitment industry. Yeah. And it's tough. And I, and I feel personally attacked <laughs> as, as a recruiter there. But what I think we need to do is shine a light on, A, not just the good recruiters out there, but also elevate the fact that most of these issues that candidates have, this comes from a leadership perspective. Mm -hmm. What's your perspective on a lot of the recruiter bashing happening right now? Or is it more frustration coming from the market with candidates the current state of the of the of the, the hiring market. I think a lot of it comes from the current state of the hiring market, to be honest. You know, there's been a fluctuation of too many jobs, not enough people, then too many people, not enough jobs. We've seen these layoffs, particularly with tech companies, tech for example, layoffs. that have been that's been really tough. And so I think that especially when there's high volume, it becomes really difficult for recruiters to build high quality relationships with candidates, which is why tech is so important, you know? So I think that the issue du jour is balancing the humanity of what we do in our practice. Because mm -hmm. at the end of the day, 
recruiting is a people business. Yeah. And if you take a look around this floor here, there's a million AI platforms out here. Mm -hmm. And my kind of big talking point is any company, any person, any individual, I don't care who you are, utilize AI as a tool and not a crush. Mm -hmm. Don't overly rely on it. What's your take on the on the current state of AI in HR and TA? Mm -hmm. What are some concerns that you're having? What are some of the things that are exciting you? Let's spend a few minutes talking here. Sure. I mean, I, I think one big concern that's obviously a big topic is algorithmic bias. Big time. Um, in the selection process in particular, selection assessment process in particular. So uh, that's always a concern, of course. And now we see, you know, some states that are actually banning tools like this, like New York, for example. What's New York doing? Uh, so New York uh, has banned the use of um, uh, some AI components in the actual selection process of recruitment because of algorithmic bias. Mm -hmm. Uh, which makes it really difficult because if you're a multi-state employer, you're just, you know, you're hiring how you, remotely, how, you, yeah, how, how in the world, that? you know? Uh, yeah. So that's really tough. Um, I, I think that that's a big thing to look out for, but for the most part, it's pros. I think that it's exactly as you said, if it's not a crutch, if it's just a tool that you're using and what you have in mind, especially when I was managing recruitment teams, what I'd always said was, look, candidate experience is really important for so many reasons. First, because of our own brand, right? right it's the first touch point of any brand. Exactly. But also because we want to make sure that when someone onboards, they're really excited to be here, they're engaged and you know, all that good stuff. And so if you can use tools to help save you time which exactly. is what ai can do because it helps take away some of those repeatable tasks that you have to anything do anything that you could automate and cause and enable or could have more time yeah yeah absolutely yeah then you're able to to spend time on those quality relationships and really work on your employer brand and work with the hr team on your evp or employer value proposition mm -hmm. and and showcase that in the right way uh which honestly i don't think a lot of companies do a really good job of. i think that they're getting kind of you know, bright lights, flashy buttons, and they like, oh, well, this is the latest and greatest tool. How is it gonna, how is it going to replace our recruiters? <clears throat> and I think that's the first problem, as you mentioned before, a smart leadership will say, no, I want to empower my recruiters Correct. to focus more on the human elements, mm -hmm. the relationships, the conversations, the motivations, because they are the first line in any company. They're the first, they're, recruiters are the true brand ambassadors mm -hmm. and the companies are recognized this and doing it well yep and they're utilizing ai to do it so they can have more time in that, in that process and we talk about what's going wrong with ai candidates out there are saying ai is auto rejecting me is this really happening what are you seeing out there as far as you know, you know ai and ats platforms the scoreability is there but it's still a human and unless it's a self uh rejection automatic uh, you know knockout question like state tech skill right. uh government clearance whatever right that is really tough i've heard from a lot of people that they feel like they've been rejected because of those ai algorithms and you know one of the things that i've suggested to a candidate like that is hey take the job description go to chat gpt and tell chat gpt what keywords do i have mm -hmm. to have in my resume to fit this job description because that's kind of what you have to do to match things up right you want to get the attention right exactly um but for the most part i think that it's a, it they're fairly good tools out there that that help eliminate a lot of the time that recruiters are spending kind of screening through all of these resumes sure you might miss somebody every once in a while but for the most part they do a pretty good job right and i think that as you mentioned earlier right now in this current market the pipeline is flooded mm -hmm. and there's a lot of tools out there that are using ai to auto apply mm -hmm. and i am i'm a little bit divided on this one when I put on my pro candidate hat, obviously I want to make things easier, right? I want to make it more efficient for candidates to apply. But at the same time, if you're not setting these controls and you're applying to everything, you're flooding the system and you're part of the problem. Well, I actually, yes, I actually don't think that that's good at all because it essentially just encourages people to apply absolutely anywhere, regardless of whether or not they're pride. qualified. And it adds way more work to the recruiters to figure out who's actually qualified and who's not. I'm a big believer that a candidate should be putting effort into every job application they put in. So for me, for example, when I was running recruitment teams, I would actually specifically put certain tasks in the application that required them to put effort into it. Hey, everybody. Adam here. Today's podcast is brought to you by the team at Fountain. Fountain is your full service frontline workforce management platform. I have to tell you, Fountain's offerings are some of the most robust I've seen from any product in the space. They offer full solutions for recruiting, hiring, and retention. They are truly a one-stop shop focused on the frontline workforce. They also create informative content using their data. For example, they analyze a bunch of data from their fast food clients and create a trend report you can download now on their website. 
We also have a new ebook out called Frontline Voices. It's a lot to dive into, so certainly check it out. And you can learn more at fountain.com, linked in the show notes. Tell them Adam sent you. Thanks. It's fascinating that you say that. I, I think every leader should also go through their own employer employment application process. Mm-hmm. Every senior leader should do that. So recently, I had a little bit of time and I started applying to some jobs. I haven't applied to jobs in a while because I'm hearing all this chatter in the marketplace. And I noticed that too. And I think there's a fine balance of how much effort you're asking from a candidate versus too much or like, wait, I have to re-enter my whole application. No. But if you have open-ended questions, some things like, what's interesting about our company? Why do I want to work for Virgil HR? Why do I want to work for NHP Talent? And leave it open-ended and see what they write. Yeah. You're not going to know. I mean, sometimes you can tell if they're using chat GPT for their answers. You and I could both tell a, yeah. a formulaic. But using, let's put the human back into the process and find that balance. And I also think we're so early on, Jocelyn, that we're still kind of figuring it out. Mm-hmm. How are you working with, with some of your partners and clients to ensure that we're keeping the human in HR? Well, that's funny you say that because we actually just did a big strategy session as a business a couple weeks ago. And the mission statement that we revised was all about giving HR time back so they could focus on what matters most, people. And I think that that is so important. If there are tools Great. out there that can really help you focus more on people strategy, encouraging a people-centric strategy mm. for the business as a whole, and you're able to spend more time on people and less time on the administrative burden, that's a huge win. And so that's what we're here to do. And that's a big passion of mine. So taking that passion, and I want to talk a little bit about your conversations with senior leadership. We all spoke, we spoke about this before, about how HR, talent, people starts at the top. How do you help some leaders who may be struggling with this recognize that they have a problem? And what's what's the right approach to coaching them to say, listen, your people are your priority. And if you don't change this, you're going to have incredible attrition rates. You're going to be losing people. It'll be incredibly hard to find people to hire here. You've got a real problem on your hands. Yeah. I mean, you have all different types of leaders that create a negative effect. You have toxic leaders, you have absent leaders, you know, there are all different types of profiles. So Mm. I think the approach does depend on the type of leader that individual is, but for the most part, just to kind of give a high level on this, um, a really great way of doing that, it's all around building relationships with these other executives and gaining that, um, that support and that credibility with them and then influencing them. So a lot of the time when I'm, when, well, previously when I was in my role as um, a VP of HR, I would work with executive leaders and talk about, hey, you know, um, what do you think about this? You know, like kind of these are more getting them to think for themselves so that they come up with a conclusion on their own rather right. than me telling Co- them. Coach them to come up with the answer versus you dictating it. Exactly. Yeah, they don't they don't really like that very much. Well, let, let's put a positive spin on it. What, what, what is some of those green flags you're seeing of positive change in our industry? In the recruitment industry? Recruitment and HR. We, I like to separate them, mm-hmm. but for the purposes of today's show, it's folks playing at home, we're going to combine that into one question. Uh, sure. Um, look, I think that there's some really cool tech coming out. Uh, obviously, I kind of live in the tech world, so that's always top of mind for me. Well, give us some alpha. What are you seeing? Uh, so I think that there's some really interesting tech in the performance management, mm-hmm. the listening space, employee engagement. I love all of that. And so some seeing, great listening tools that make it like, yes. for example, the, the video uh, like MetaView. Shout out to my folks over at MetaView. Job picks is a good one where they're able to write record the interviews. Mm-hmm. So that way, if I'm a recruiter and I'm passing information to a hiring manager, it's, hey, Jocelyn, I'm going to highlight these two lines here because this is all you need to hear. You don't have to hear the whole interview and mm-hmm. we're not playing the telephone game. You're hearing it directly from the candidate's mouth, and I'm yeah. able to add my my show notes on top of it. Yeah, I, I love adding video into the interview component. I think that's fantastic. So you're seeing that on the listening side, on the engagement side, performance management, but I also think you're seeing it on some of like the core compliance pieces as well. We're looking at a, not, a lot of new tech that's coming out to assist with pay equity, for example. And I think that that, yeah, I think well, that, what that, are you that seeing is very that let's, let's unpack that a little bit. Because pay equity yeah. is, is there's multiple elements to that too, right? There's mm-hmm. there's race, gender, location, demographics, location, yeah. uh, different types of companies. How is the tech improving that? I mean, what kind of data is it taking into account? What are you seeing out there? This well, is new to me, and I, I find it exciting in that kind of nerdy HR way that we all kind of love. That's why we're here. I know, right? yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I'm seeing it in a couple of different ways. The first is um, new tech coming out, and I actually couldn't tell you the name of the company. I just kind of read through these things. But new tech we'll coming out. We'll drop them in afterwards, <laughs> and maybe we'll get some more clicks over here. <laughs> 
um, that is automating the audit process. So it's pulling data out of the HRIS, it's doing the full analysis. It, um, I haven't actually seen anything yet that will pull benchmarking data and start building out uh, salary levels, salary bands for you. I haven't seen that yet. I also have not seen yet the compliance aspect to it as well. That's something I'd love to get into. Uh, I think that that's really fascinating, but there's so much momentum there that's fantastic. And I do think that a lot of people have kind of just expected that the status quo is that things really suck. Um, and uh, and they're starting to see more movement on the tech side that's really exciting, well, so the expectations are higher. You hit on something interesting too. It's the verification authenticity of the data. And I think that mm -hmm. when we're talking about AI, first question I ask any company who has a new tech product out there, they go, okay, where's your data coming from and what are you doing with it? Mm -hmm. with AI? Don't just drop AI, I mean, it's not a blanket statement for everything. Mm -hmm. But you said something one step further, which got my, which piqued my interest. <laughs> How are we auditing that data to ensure that it's correct, authentic, coming from the right location? So these are layers that we're learning as we go. So actually, it's funny you say that because one of the things that we do is we call it human verified AI, where we have AI build pieces of our product, but we have lawyers look at everything to make sure it's all accurate because it's generative. So there's a lot of misinformation by nature. Right. Big people need to know the difference of generative AI and what that means as a machine is creating a lot of the answers to its own questions versus in taking the raw data and assessing it from that yes. point, right? There's, mm -hmm. there's, in fact, heck me on that, people. Um, I want to go back to talking about your career a little bit. You classify yourself as an HR journalist. Mm -hmm. Was there ever a desire to like really hyper niche down into one specific area or do you no. like being where you are? No, never. I've always really enjoyed getting my hands into absolutely everything and being that, you know, jack of all trades, master of none type thing because it's really allowed me to build a full scope people strategy for a business that I otherwise wouldn't have been able to do if I'd focused on total reward or TA or you know engagement or something like that. So I really enjoy being a part of all aspects of HR and find each of them really fascinating. What's, what's keeping you up at night these days? Um, me personally, I think it's fundraising. Fundraising is always really hard as a startup. It's it's a slog. I'm not gonna and, lie. And sadly, there's stats out there that female-owned companies, female-led companies, have lower success with fundraising, and that's another big thing that we need to change in this space. Yeah, big time. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, o only two percent of VC money goes to female founders. But when we go off camera, we'll talk about a couple of things. I have some interesting people I want to introduce you okay, to. Okay, thank you. I think that'd be exciting space. So, what are you doing to overcome that? Oh, well, so much of it, and I think this goes back to pretty much anything I've talked about in HR is the relationship building aspect. So it's, I've been building relationships with venture capital firms that I was too early for, for the last couple of years. So now I'm at a point where I'm kind of more within their thesis and we have that relationship built. We've been doing touch points every, you know, three to six months. Um, and that's been really successful for us. We also have a fantastic group of existing investors that have been really committed as well. And they've been really supportive too. So and advising. pretty lucky. Oh, uh, yeah. That's they've a big been one. It's not, it's not just we need and want your money, but mm -hmm. if I'm bringing you on as an investor, I want your expertise. Mm -hmm. exactly. And having strategic investors and strategic investors lined up for that. So let's talk about silver lining to good things. What's on, on a professional side, what, what's, what's really putting a smile on your face these days? Hmm. Um, Honestly, uh, this might sound a little silly, but I silly right, on the podcast. <laughs> uh, right now I do sales. I just hired my first account executive. So I've been doing sales on my own the last two and a half years. Is that something that comes naturally to you? No, not at all. Not at all. Were you excited to get into that or are you like shit? I know it's an aspect of what I have to do um, as, a, as, a, as a founder. <laughs> I don't like the sales process because I'm not a very pushy person. I always am like, yeah, you either like it or you don't like it. You just let me know type thing. Uh, but I do really love talking to HR professionals during the sales process and getting feedback on the product. So I, that is something that makes me so happy as a professional today is being able to do these demos and getting feedback from them and then doing product discovery calls mm -hmm. with our current customers, getting feedback on the product. What's really cool is how often people are just blown away by the product. Right, like it's one of those things you let the product talk for itself, but then you have to come in so I want to I want to bring it home here, and I'm going to go back to a traditional podcast podcast question that I have not asked yet during our interviews. Justin, what's it, what's what's the single greatest piece of advice you've received that you take action on every day? Tailor your message to your audience. Yeah, it was one of my uh, first jobs. It was at Target. 
you choose two strengths and a weakness. And I put one of my strengths is communicating effectively. And my boss said, no, that's not your strength at all. That's your weakness. Mm. I said, how is that possible? I speak, I'm a philosophy major. I speak well, I write well, you know, the whole deal. Clearly communicate. Yeah. And uh, she said, oh, you're making people cry because uh, you're, you're too brash. Mm. You need to tailor your message to your audience. And I became obsessed with that. And I think it's made me really successful in my career. I think that's solid that. advice for anybody. And let's leave this. What's, what's Jocelyn's golden piece of advice for anybody on the job search right now? Anybody on the job search? Um, I think the big thing is do your research on the companies that, you're in, that you are applying to and don't just do the spray and pray type thing. That is a big one. Um, and when you are doing that, really make sure that their values and their company culture align with yours because the last thing you want is to start a job and leave three months later because you're miserable. No, and I think it's about managing expectations and really understanding what the job. And I always tell job seekers to do their own their own due diligence. Yep. Jocelyn, I want to thank you so much for joining us here on the podcast. I want to thank our friends over at Fountain. They're incredible. Thank you so much for making all this happen. Jocelyn, where can folks find you? Where can they connect? Where can they learn more? Uh, yeah, thank you. So you can see our website at www.virgilhr.com. Or you can find me, Jocelyn King, uh, on LinkedIn. Reach out. Connect with it. Jocelyn. You know where to find out more. Jocelyn, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you very much for having me. It's a pleasure. Me. Thanks, everybody. Wisdom is forever, but for us, it's time to go. Thank you for joining us. Luckily, we'll be back with our next episode soon, jam-packed with more incredible humans. Thank you for listening, subscribing, and sharing. To join the conversation, search The podcast on LinkedIn. And to catch up on past episodes and more info, please visit www.thepausecast.com.